to the first ever Spirits uh, live Hangout in the Air on Google+. Plus. And we're, we're happy to be joined today by Thomas Kutnan from Purity Vodka. And uh, welcome, Thomas. Well, thank you, Jeff. It's, uh, for people who don't know, I'm, I'm here just north of Boston in a little town called Marblehead. And you're actually um, coming in from where in Sweden? I'm from Malmö in the very south of Sweden, just on the border to Denmark. Very, very cool. Very cool. Well, some people may not be familiar with Purity Vodka, so let's, let's start right there. T tell me about how this came to be and what is Purity Vodka. Well, Purity Vodka is very much everything that uh, people don't expect of uh, vodka. And to, to tell you about the background of Purity Vodka, I really need to say a few words about myself. I've been working with spirits for 20 years, and I've been producing uh, scotch whiskey, gins, bitters, aquavits, liqueurs, etc. But I have never really been a vodka person myself. I've, I've always found vodka to be quite boring, more about image and marketing than about uh, heart and soul and passion. And, uh, but hey, I'm, I'm from Sweden. Sweden is vodka country. We have been producing vodka here for 800 years. On oh, we have a, a little crosstalk in there, <laughs> starting to broadcast the page. Um, so th I want to hear more about that. So because I, I, I had read that your background was actually not in vodka. How does a guy who you know who isn't a vodka guy get into making vodka? Well, it's simple. I'm a spirit geek, and I, I'm a Swede. We have been producing vodka for 800 years in Sweden, and so I really couldn't help myself but geeking into the Swedish vodka history. And when I did that, I suddenly realized that it was not vodka itself I didn't like, but what vodka has turned into over the past 150 years after the Industrial Revolution. Because in the old days, vodka in Sweden was produced exactly the same way as single malt whiskey in Scotland. The only excep exception was that in Sweden, we didn't mature our spirit in oak casks. But hey, the Scots didn't mature their spirit in oak cask either for the first couple of hundred years. So, in the old days, Swedish vodka and Scottish uh, single malt whiskey was exactly the same thing. But over the years, things uh, happened as it developed in di different directions. Uh, but it was always a spirit that had plenty of character and body and flavors, etc., because it was actually distilled in a pot still. It was uh, malted barley, uh, just as in, 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 uh, in Scotland. But after the Industrial Revolution, after coffee invented continuous distillation, uh, vodka became more and more industrial and turned into what we know it to be uh, today, a grain-neutral spirit, very light, neutral, and, well, to be honest, quite boring spirit. So I wanted to create an old-school vodka. Now, what, what do you say to people? I mean, because there are, I mean, especially in um, a lot of the craft spirits markets and, and, you know, there's a connoisseurship, I think, now around spirits. You know, some people give vodka a, a little bit of a bad rap, say it's, you know, neutral, it's boring. Um, you know, what, what, how do you respond to that? Well, I, I, I think it's uh, well-deserved, actually. I think uh, the, the vodka industry has a, a, a big problem because... Quite frankly, it is very easy to, to produce vodka. It's very uh, inexpensive, which means that uh, you can make a lot of money. And that, uh, that leads to attracting the wrong kind of people. Uh, there is really no one who is producing vodka because they are passionate about vodka. A wine producer is, of course, a businessman as well, a cognac producer, a whiskey producer, etc. But they have... They, have, they are producing their, their spirits and their wines because they are passionate about what they are doing. And I think the vodka industry lacks that kind of passion. That we see more and more micro distillers popping up, and that is a good thing. Unfortunately, unfortunately many of those are micro distillers who are aiming to produce malt whiskey, bourbons, rums, etc. But in the but they realize that it takes many years for them to have something that is decent to drink. So in the meanwhile, they're producing white spirit to make some money, which means that uh, the choices for consumers are either industrial spirits, which are very boring, 
or uh, handcrafted spirits by people who are not really passionate about vodka, so they can actually be even worse than, than the industrial spirits. But the good thing is that there are more and more vodka producers who are very serious about what they're doing, and they are aiming to produce vodka with more body and character than ev ever before. So I think we, we see a lot of uh, exciting things happening, and there are more and more people who are uh, uh, discovering this. Great. One of the things that I noticed, and, and I, um, you know, I've really, you can see from the bottle here, um, I've really saved tasting purity to, to taste with you, because I, I wanted my my first impressions and, and my, my kind of my first view of it to be together here on this virtual tasting. But one of the things I noticed on the bottle um, was, you know, this little thing where it said, made with the state distilled winter wheat and barley. Um, that was surprising to me, to see uh, a Swedish vodka using barley. So talk about that. What, what, where does that come in? Well, I would say 99% of all vodkas are made from one single ingredient. And for me, that is a little bit like an artist uh, making a painting with one single color. In order to create something exciting, you need to be working with different uh, ingredients. And the, the two ingredients we are using is, uh, is winter wheat and barley. The winter wheat is different to most types of wheat because normally you plant the wheat in the spring and harvest in the autumn. With the winter wheat, it's opposite. You plant it in the, in the autumn you let it grow over the fall, winter under the snow, spring, summer, and then harvest it 11 months later the next coming fall. And just as with any fruit or berry or vegetable, everything that grows slowly will have a deeper, more intense flavor to it, but it will also give us a higher starch content. Uh, if, however, if we would only be using the wheat, we would end up with a very light, uh, elegant, crisp, bready vodka, but also a vodka that would lack a little bit of the body, the character, the texture, and the mouthfeel. So that's why, why we uh, add the two-row barley, the same type of barley which is used for, used for single malt uh, uh, whiskey. We malt it, we uh, produce the mash, and we distill it, and that gives us a more heavy, robust spirit. And by mixing the two together, we can create some magic. So. One of the things is that, you know, and the whole concept, I think, on many of a vodka tasting um, is kind of funny. I mean, uh, you know, because we have so many vodkas on the market that are neutral or, you know, or, or flavorless, um, I'm interested in, you know, exploring here with, uh, with Purity, how do you taste the vodka? I, I mean, I know we have our ways of tasting vodkas here at Drink Spirits, but, um, you know, you being a master blender and, and with one of the, the brands, very interested in, in having you walk us and, and the people who are watching us here on how exactly do you taste the vodka? I would love to t uh, talk you through it. Uh, I think uh, vodka is actually one of the most difficult things to, to, uh, to uh, sample because there are so many flavors in Purita Vodka but they are also very very delicate so it takes more of the the person uh, uh, trying the pure the vodka than it would take from a person try sampling a wine or a whiskey or a cognac. So, uh, first of all, we, we need to pick uh, a good glass. And I, I can see that you have something that looks like a, a porto glass in front of you. Yeah, I have. I mean, we, we had a, a selection of glasses from the, the Glencairn to, you know, this little tulip glass. Um, we sometimes, depending, we'll, we'll taste out of a, a wine glass. But yes, yeah, um, this is one. The tulip glass is something that we that we've used to taste uh, the vodka out before. So I figured it'd be a good one to start with. This is this is the, the glass that I'm using. Uh, I'm uh, usually using um, a vodka tasting glass from uh, Oroforce in, in in Sweden. A crystal glass, which is perfect. It has. Uh, quite a wide base, a narrow uh, opening, which works perfect. And when I, when I tell people about how to taste the vodka, I usually say that if you know how to taste wine, you know how to taste vodka as long as you do every, everything the opposite way around. <laughs> the opposite way? That, yes. That's funny. Because, I, I, I mean, I always see, when we taste out in the world, uh, I do always see people do everything with spirits that they tend to do with wine. Well, it's it's the worst thing that you, that you can ever do. You need to respect the fact that alcohol uh, are different if it's uh, wine or if it's a spirit. 
as, and especially uh, considering the alcohol content. A wine is usually 10 to 15 de uh, ABV, while uh, a spirit usually is 40 ABV or, or above. So, uh, as we know, wine tasters usually take the glass, swirl it around quite heavily, dip the nose into the glass, take a mouthful, swirl it around in the mouth, and then spit it out. As I said, do everything the opposite way around. I usually divide the sniffing into th in three uh, 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 moments. The first one is lifting the glass without swirling at all, putting my nose uh, on, uh, over the glass. Don't put it inside the glass because the the strength of the alcohol will uh, will damage the, uh, your, your, your nose and your nose is by far your most uh, delicate delicate tool here. And when you're sniffing, keep your mouth open. Okay, okay. let me let me follow along with you here. And uh, if you uh, watching here have a bottle of purity vodka, or if you don't, we're actually recording this, so you can come back to right here and and taste with us. So um, I'm gonna open this nice bottle of purity here. And uh, now, well, Thomas, how much should I be pouring in glass? You know, when I'm tasting, is it a little? Is it a lot? I mean, where where what kind of sample should I be using here? I would say just a little. I would say two or three centiliters would be fine. I don't know how, how much that is in your U.S. measures. Um, I, I travel enough, so I, I think we're about there on it. So. Yep. <laughs> um, one of these days, one of these days uh, here in the states, we'll 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 be able to easily deal with the metric, especially in drinks. I know a lot of bartenders would. We'd like to use a lot more precise measurements, but for right now we're, we've got uh, we've got ounces. So um, so I'm right here with you with the uh, with the purity, and I'm I'm gonna do the sniffing right along with you. And uh, I have noticed that especially a lot of guys have a difficult time to sniff and keep the mouth open at the same time. Uh, I I don't know why it is, but but do it. It it makes a big difference. So for me, the first thing that I'm that I'm smelling here. I mean, I definitely can smell great. I smell vanilla and grain. I mean, I, is that wheat and vanilla? Yeah. Right here, right here. So, so on that, that's what I'm getting right, right from your vodka. I find lots and lots of uh, minerals. Uh, if you are out sailing in the summer on the sea, and and it starts raining, and the fresh rain hits the hits the the salty uh, seawater, that kind of umami-like aroma that arises. Uh, is, which is almost uh, a little bit metallic. Uh, that is uh, what I find to be dominant in in uh, in the first sniff. Yeah. Well, so again, I mean, I think what you're talking about here, and it's something that uh, I, I am reading, is that there's that salinity that uh, I think most people don't realize. Um, and it's just kind of an important to note when we're tasting spirits. Um, you know, when it, when Tomas is saying you know minerality, or I'm saying vanilla, um, there is no vanilla or minerals in this glass. You're getting the character from the base spirit, from the fermented ingredients, and the still. Um, well, one of Jeff, the things I, Jeff, one Jeff, of the, I, I'm sorry to inter interrupt you. You're absolutely right that there is no vanilla, but there are actually minerals because we are one of the, one of few vodka producers that are not using distilled water when, when we are watering down the the alcohol. We are actually using mineral-rich water. Wow, well, that's really that's that's fascinating. So. That would absolutely, considering that we have a, a bottle of vodka here that's um, 40%, or, sorry, we're, we're 80 proof, so 40% alcohol, 60% of what we're actually consuming here is that, that the water that's not distilled, so the mineral water. Exactly. And uh, my intention from, from the very beginning was to use 100% natural mineral rich water. Uh, however, I, I did actually have a problem with, with that because after six, seven, eight months in the bottles, the minerals started to falling out and you could actually see a white ring around the neck and sediments floating around. So I spent over one year to create the perfect formula which is a mixture of natural mineral rich water and deionized uh, water which is a much lighter filtration than distilled water. Uh, so and uh, uh, when I had uh, uh, spent spent the, the, the year on creating the, the formula, I was actually a little bit nervous because I wasn't uh, 
really sure if I was the only one that would actually notice the difference or if the consumers would actually notice it themselves. So I invited three of the world's best sommeliers to a blind tasting, uh, including the, the world championship sommelier at the time, and had them sample 12 different vodkas. Six of them were purity vodkas. The other six were uh, top, uh, qu uh, top uh, quality brands uh, that we consider to be the, the toughest competitors. The six purity vodkas, the only difference between them uh, uh, was the water content and how much mineral water we had in it. And since I'm telling you the story, we did well. All three sommeliers uh, had purity vodka as their number one favorite. All three sommeliers had the purity vodka with the highest level of natural mineral rich water as their number one favorite. But what really made me happy was that two out of the three sommeliers had all six purity vodkas as their six favorites in the correct falling order. So water makes a difference, but just as long as you don't tamper with it. So if you're using distilled water, well, you can just as well take water from your, your toilet because distilling it is like sending it to, to dry cleaning. Nate? Wow, wow. So um, smelling this, and I'm coming back to it. We, we've had a, uh, oh, actually, I was going to ask you, we, we talk about being a master blender, and uh, you, I don't think anybody would fathom the fact that not only are you blending in terms of necessary spirit, but but with water, blending different kinds of water. It's I, I actually have not heard of a spirit company who's who's doing that. So it's it's it is fascinating. Well, water is fantastic. I've been moving three times within Sweden. Every time I have I had to change coffee brand because the water that works different with different coffees. So it it makes the different all the difference in the world. But let's go back to, to tasting the, the and sniffing the vodka. So we have been doing step one of, of the sniffing. Step two is to tilt the glass and uh, move the glass around, not the vodka itself. So keep the vodka still and turn the glass around so you're coating the inside of, of, of the glass. Okay, I've got, I've got this glass nice and, and, and coated on the inside. And then sniff again, keep your nose a bit over the glass and keep your mouth open. And once you have done that, let's go to step number three and give it a very, very light swirling around and sn sniff it. And by dividing this into three different steps, you can first discover all the light aromas, then the medium aromas, and at the end, all the heavy aromas. Yeah, I think I got a little more of the minerality when we when we coated the glass, and I and I came in with my nose to that the coated glass. More of the minerality we were talking about did emerge, and, but that's fascinating. That actually, the the process of of coating the glass is not something I've I've ever actually seen before, and it um, it does. I mean, I'm really impressed. It does give a really different read on the spirit. I, I will be integrating that into some of my tasting. Please do. And I, I, find the, uh, I start finding the vanilla now, a little bit of rosebuds, a uh, little bit of citrus, more lime than lemon, uh, licorice, uh, the kind of bready licorice uh, flavor that you can find as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, I'm getting a little more, and I think I think once we started to agitate it a little bit, uh, I got a little bit more of the spice out of it. I mean, the spice didn't really read much at all on the initial nose, and I think some of the, the spicier nose, spicier notes in the vodka seemed to come through once it was a little bit of agitated. Yes. So now it's time to to taste it, and uh, as I said before, do it the opposite way of uh, when when you're trying wine. So just take two or three small drops. Okay. Let them coat the tongue, mix it with saliva, and do not spit it out, but swallow it because it's when it goes down the throat, you can really start tasting. Yep, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I, and there's a I, lot I, there. There's a lot there. There's that, um, you know, uh, right from the bat, my mouth is. is Full of, of of flavor. I mean, there's not there's nothing neutral about what we're tasting here. 
No, it's uh, once again you have plenty of minerals. You have the rose buds. You have the vanilla. It's almost sweet and salty at the same time. Uh, but what 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 people will find it will be different from person to person. The 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 only really important thing is that you don't find a burn. Any vodka that has a burn is an example of poor distillation. If it's good or bad, well, that's up to each and every one. But if it has a burn, well, then someone has not done done their job right. And that's, I think, an important point to talk about, the difference between reading spice, which I'm getting kind of in the middle of my tongue, in the middle of my mouth on this one, and burn, which, I mean, for me, when I get burned, often right at the front of the mouth on the gums. Um, how, I mean, how do you recommend people sort of be able to pick up between, you know, spice, which we're getting here, and, God, I wish I had a bottle of Svedka here, burn like you would get from a bottle of Svedka? Well, one of the mo most mi misused words in the, in the industry is smooth. Every single vodka person around the world are talking about their vodka being smooth. And I would say that 99% of all vodkas are not smooth because in order to be smooth, you need to combine character with complexity, with body and texture, etc. And by having them working together, then you can create something that actually overpowers the alcohol. Uh, Isla whiskey, PT Isla whiskey is a perfect example of how flavors can overpower uh, alcohol. There's a lot of people who cannot drink PT Isla whiskey, while there are a lot of people who, who don't drink anything but it. But I think we can all agree that when you drink in a really PT smoky whiskey, then you, just, then you forget for, for a while that it's actually alcohol. And it's exactly the same thing here, but we, are, you, you work with so much more smoother, uh, more delicate uh, uh, flavors. So you can compare the smoky Isla whiskey with with someone playing an electrical guitar, very loud, very dominant. You cannot miss it. Well, Purity Vodka is more of a symphony orchestra where all the different instruments are working together so that you should not be able to identify one single instrument. But by having them working together, you can overpower the 40 percent alcohol by, by volume or 80 proof. Yeah, and, and we've got a lot going on in here. So we took the first sip, which is a very small sip. Um, yeah. where, do we, where do we go from there? From there, we, go to, we add a little bit of water. And it's exactly as with single malt whiskey. Uh, we we're doing the same thing. A lot of people drinking single malt whiskey add water to their whiskey. Someone drinking a cognac would never add water. Someone drinking an almond jack would never add water. Someone drinking a Calvados would never drink, add any water. And the reason is cognac and almond jacks and Calvados are made with grapes and uh, uh, apples that contain sugar. And sugar doesn't react to water. While a single malt whiskey is made from malted barley, which contains a lot of starch, and starch react to water. It's almost like the human body. If you get a stick in your finger, a piece of uh, some dirt in your eye, your body reacts and tries to push away the foreign object. Exactly the same thing with you with you, your whiskey. And when you add water to the whiskey, the uh, starch will react and try to push away the foreign object being in the water. And when it does, it will release more flavors and aromas over a limited period of time. Exactly the same thing with vodka. However, vodka can be made from so many different ingredients. Traditional vodka was made from uh, wheat, barley, potatoes. But nowadays, vodka can be made from grapes, from uh, apples, from pears, even from milk. And uh, that means that vodka will react differently depending on what, what ingredients you are doing. So if, if you have one of those modern vodkas made from grapes, for example, and you add water, absolutely nothing will happen. If it's an, an, an inexpensive vodka made from corn or molasses, you will have a very little reaction. While if you take in a traditional vodka made from uh, grains or potatoes, you will have a big reaction when you're adding the water. And purity vodka being uh, a vodka with one of the highest starch content due to the fact that we're using malted barley and uh, uh, winter wheat will create a huge reaction. 
So when you add the water to your purity vodka, it will be like a flower bud opening up, releasing uh, many, many more aromas and flavors. Okay, so, let me do that. I, I have uh, this is actually my whiskey uh, whiskey dropper. I, I, we know um, one of the things that we talk a lot about on drink spirits is not being afraid to have your spirits the way you want it. And I think you know, as Tomas had said, water is really an important tool in your toolkit for tasting things. So I'm, I'm going to give uh, purity a, a couple of uh, eyedropper pulls here of water, and, and then let's 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 revisit this. Yeah, the mouthfeel completely changes. Definitely much more rounder, and um, some of the sweeter tones emerge, and the spice definitely seeing a little bit of an enhancement in that as well. Yep, um, I think it uh, it makes all the difference in the world. The, this is actually a spirit that you can drink as it is, neat at room temperature. But exactly the same thing will happen if you drink your purity vodka on the rocks. The the ice starts melting. If you make a a martini with it. If you make any cocktail where you stir it over ice or you shake it, etc., the ice melts and it will bring out so much more flavors from the vodka itself. But the beauty is that it uh, the the starch here will also react almost like cream or butter in cooking. So if you're using natural in ingredients, fresh uh, herbs, fresh fruits, berries, etc., uh, it will enhance the flavor of those as well. Well, on the opposite end, if you're using sweet liquors, uh, Coke or Fanta or Sprite or uh, artificial ingredients, the sugar coating will just cover everything and nothing will really happen. So putting water into your vodka is actually a really good way, especially if, you, if, if what, what it's made from isn't on the neck, of seeing if you've got something here that's either maybe potentially sugar enhanced or from you know a non-grain source. Exactly. My favorite uh, cocktail is uh, probably the most simple cocktail in the world. It's the Purit Martini. What I do is I take three parts Purit Vodka, one part water, stir it over ice, and strain it into a shelled martini glass. No vermouth, no olive, no twist. I'm just letting the water do, do, do the job for me. That was one of, one of the, the interesting things. We've had a discussion on this before uh, about vodka and vermouth and the, the thought that perhaps vodka and vermouth are not as uh, bosom buddies as perhaps gin and vermouth are. What are your thoughts on that? I think when it comes to vodka, nothing is as easy, uh, as simple as people think, because there is a great variety of vodkas. Uh, if you would look at the flavor chart and have vodkas uh, being divided into light and full-bodied, being uh, neutral or flavorful, uh, we would be uh, on, the, on, on the top hand side, full-bodied with a lot of character and complexity, while a majority would be in the middle and uh, uh, f or in, in the bottom left hand side being light and neutral. And those vodkas are actually tailor-made to be mixed with sweeter ingredients and uh, there are plenty of those that actually mix rather well with vermouth because the vermouth adds something to the very light and neutral spirit. While the the vodka that has more character and body to them, they do not work at all with vermouth. So I, I, I completely agree there. So for those of you watching, we actually on the Drink Spirits website have the flavor map uh, that Tomas is referring to that uh, you can pick up and it's got it's great it's got all of the vodkas uh, on the market well maybe most of the vodkas are the, the major ones and kind of maps them where they fall on the scale um, one of the reasons you know we're sitting here talking to Tomas and talking about vodka is uh, we feel it's really important that even with vodka that you make an informed decision with taste that you taste the ones find the ones that you want uh, that that that, that uh, you like and uh, realize that, that we're not talking about one vodka to rule them all. There are different vodkas for different occasions. And, uh, you know, as we've talked here with Tomas today, um, you know, looking at purity vodka is one that, you know, can be enjoyed with water or enjoyed neat uh, and has a lot of flavor. Um, I, know, I know you're running to catch a, a plane to, to go back to uh, Stockholm. 
but I wanted to thank you for, for coming on, Tomas, today. And uh, for those of you watching, please like this video on YouTube uh, and subscribe to our, uh, to our channel here. Also, of course, we are in, on Google+. Plus. We're going to be doing more of these Google Plus Hangouts. Um, Tomas, thank you for helping setting history with me, as this is the first virtual tasting ever done on Google Plus Hangout Live. So uh, you're in the history books uh, for, for something quite interesting. Well, thank you, Jeff. It was great fun and school, as we say in Sweden. School. And, uh, you know, we're going to have to have you back on a, at a later date to talk not just uh, vodka, but spirits. You, you seem like you're an absolute wealth of knowledge and, uh, uh, and experience in the spirit space, and it, it's just a real pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much. Skull. Well, thank you. Skull.